Okay, if you have your Bibles, open your Bibles <clears throat> to two places, Philippians 1.21 and Philippians 2.21. In the last few weeks, we've looked at Caleb, Rahab, and Daniel. And tonight I want us to look at two other people, and we'll be getting into that in, in just a moment. But Philippians 1.21 it says, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. And in verse, chapter 2 and verse 21, for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. So let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Brother Lily, would you lead us in prayer, please? Father, we thank you for your love to us, and we are thankful so uh, much, Father, for the privilege of being here together to uh, gather around to hear thy word uh, being uh, proclaimed. And we do pray that you will be with Brother Malcolm as he shares the word with us. And may our hearts be open. And may we understand clearly what you uh, want to teach us tonight. We do ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Philippians 121 says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You know, a lot of people think, well, that's a, that's a hard thing to do. But you know, it wouldn't be in the Word of God if it wasn't possible for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Paul, the Apostle Paul said that, and he thought, said in chapter 2, he speaks, there's three people that are of the same mind. When it says that they have the same mind, it speaks of a, a similar spirit. So we see Paul, we see Timothy, and we see Epaphroditus. And so tonight I want us to look at these two men, Epaphrodite, or Timothy and Epaphroditus. We know some more things about Timothy than we know about Epaphroditus. First of all, we know that Epaphrodite, or Timothy had a godly heritage. As it says in 2 Timothy 1 and 5, it said, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. You know, for a child to have a godly heritage is such a wonderful thing. I remember when I was in Fort Bliss, Texas years ago, I wasn't saved, but I was religious. I'd been raised in church, and I hung around with a guy that was, um, he was of a different persuasion. He was a Christian, but he was with a different, different group, and I, I remember one day as we were, we were going through a building, one of the barracks, he found on a phone booth a New Testament, and so he went over and picked it up, and, and he started looking, the, looking at it, and somebody came by and said, hey, let me see that. And when he did, he handed it to him, and he ran over to the door to throw it out. And again, my friend Ivan said, after, said, if you throw it out, you're going out after it. That boy turned around and gave it back to Ivan. Ivan, because Ivan was, they, they used to call him the bull when he was in college, because he was a pretty tough guy. But uh, I'll never forget, that guy began talking. He says, well, you don't understand. He said, my, life, my, my upbringing was a lot different. And I would say, that doesn't make a difference because God can take care of that. Amen. You know, and so it, it's such an important thing, though, to learn the Word of God when, when, you're, when you're a child. You know, I, they were told um, years ago, I heard a man say this, the only thing we can take to heaven with us is our children. And here we see Timothy, who had a godly mother, a godly grandmother, who were Jewish women, but their, his father was a Greek, as we're told in Acts chapter 16. But Timothy, because he had a, a godly heritage, because he had a mother and, a, and a, a grandmother that loved the Lord, Timothy knew the scriptures. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, in, in verse uh, 15, it says, And they're from a child that has known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. You know, we're fortunate in this country. I think I have 10 Bibles, you know, different study Bibles and, and different Bibles, and we're fortunate. But you know, there's people around the world that do not have the Word of God. And you know, that's such a sad thing to think. A little lady that came up to me one day in Bolivia, she said, I want one of those books. I said, well, what book are you talking about? She said, that one you talk about. You know, they don't have the chance, a lot of them don't have the opportunity to have the Word of God in their hand. And you know, it's such a wonderful thing that's going on in Fiji, 
where are, not Fiji, but right now, but uh, New Guinea, where they're handing out the Word of God to students. There's young children, they can begin reading the Word of God, and they can start understanding the Word of God, and, and <clears throat> they can know that what God has for their lives. But he knew the Word, and he was also Paul's son in the faith. You know, that, that's, that would have been a wonderful thing, uh, to have the Apostle Paul teach you about the Lord, teach you the things of the Word of God. But, you know, we have, we have children in the faith. And, you know, we should pray for them. We should love them. We should care about them. And, you know, that's how uh, Paul, I'm sure, was with, with uh, Timothy. He's calling his son in the faith. But I want us to see a few traits that Paul saw in the life of Timothy. In chapter 2 and verse 20, it says, For I have no man like-minded, who will naturally care for your state. First of all, he said that Timothy was like-minded, or said that he was of, of a similar spirit. In 2 Timothy, we'll go back over to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3, it says, Thou, therefore, endure your hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I have that in the wrong place, but, but we know that they were like-minded. We know that the Paul was a soldier of the cross. And he was telling, telling Timothy to be a soldier, to be of the same, the same spirit that I am. And he said, as a soldier, you'll suffer hardness or you'll suffer trouble. Say in Timothy chapter 1 and, and verse 8, it says, But be thou not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. He was saying to him, you know, you're going to suffer trouble. I heard Brother Jim tonight, I think it was he and Ronnie were talking about, things are going to come. Hard times are going to come. You know, we, eh, eh, let's put it this way. They're here. They're here. But you know, it's going to get worse. I believe that, but thank God that we have hope. We have the blessed hope. No matter how bad it gets, no matter what happens, we know what the future holds for us who are saved and on our way to heaven. But he said you're going to suffer afflictions, or, which means you're going to suffer hardships. You're going to be partaker of afflictions. So he was telling Timothy all these things that are going to come upon you. But then he said this, care. He said the word care. I think it's in verse 20 of Philippians 2, for I have no man, okay, for I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. You know, the word care speaks of a shepherd. And I was, as I was studying on this and, and looking, I think it was in Harry Ironside brought out some things in the book of Genesis about Jacob. As he spoke with Laban, let's go back and read it. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, or 31, excuse me. Genesis chapter 31 and verse 40. Laban was getting on to Jacob, and Jacob came, said these words to him in chapter 31 and verse 40. He said, Thus I was in the day the drought consumed me, and the frost by night, and my sleep departed from my eyes. Jacob said this to Laban. He's talking, this is how you care for the sheep. This is how you care for the sheep. He said, drought would come. He said, cold would come. At night, I wouldn't get sleep. But I loved the sheep, and I cared for the sheep. And then in Genesis 33, in verse 13, Genesis 33, 13, when he spoke to Esau, he said, and he said unto him, My Lord knoweth that the children are tender, and the flocks and herds with young are with me. And if men should overdrive them, one day all the flock will die. So he was saying, you cannot, you have to lead sheep. You can't force sheep. And so here we see what it means by the care. As, as, as Paul said, there's none who will care except Timothy. Timothy is a person who would be, have a shepherd's heart to care for the flock. And then he goes on to say in, in verse 21 of of Philippians chapter 2. He said, For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. As a, when I started, I read two verses. 
Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ and to die is vain. Our gain, I'm sorry. <clears throat> and now in chapter 2 and verse 21, it says, for all seek their own, not the things which are of Jesus Christ. And so what he was saying, he was talking about the trip. He wanted to send, Paul wanted to send someone to Philippi. Epaphroditus had come from Philippi to bring the gifts from the church and to bring messages from the church, but Epaphroditus got sick, and so he needed someone to go back to Philippi. And he was thinking about sending, sending Timothy because he couldn't find anyone else. You think this was an 800-mile trip. How long would it have taken them to go 800 miles and in the conditions, the dangers because of, of bandits along the road? But yet he was going to send Timothy, but... He didn't send Timothy, but he wanted to because of verse 21. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. In other words, what he was saying, there's not any one that I can send. Because there's not another one who's self-sacrificing. There's people that, that are in the church here lack commitment. And you know, I was talking to Jan about commitment. We used to, that, that used to be one of the hardest things in Bolivia, yet a lot of the people committed. And so we look back, it was the same way in Paul's day. There was a lack of commitment. And you know, the commitment, I think, is one of the greatest assets in the church when people are committed. And I thank God for those who are in the church here, and they serve, and they work, and they want to do right with, uh, uh, in the church. But Paul said, so many of them, the people are self are not self-sacrificing. But Timothy was that type of person. He was a, a servant, as it says in verse 22. But you know the proof of him, that as <clears throat> a son with a father, he has served me, or served with me in the gospel. Here he was saying that Timothy was a servant. He had a servant's mind. Whereas he speaks of, sir, he served with me in the gospel, that those words mean that he served as a bondman. He took up the slave life. You know, that, that'd be such, that's a hard thing to do. Take up the slave life. And that's what, that's what he's saying about Timothy. And so we see that he said about Timothy, he was like-minded. He's one who would care for the sheep. He was, uh, he was a sacrificial person. And he was also a servant. But now we look over to Epaphroditus. In verse 25... We meet the other person that says, Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. So we know that Epaphroditus, we assume that Epaphroditus was of a heathen parentage because the word Epaphroditus means favored of Aphrodite. Aphrodite was the Greek goddess of love and beauty. I mean, we wouldn't, as Christians, we wouldn't name our child uh, the servant of the, seven, of the devil. I mean, but that's it's a heathen person. He was a favorite of Aphrodite or, or lover of Aphrodite, things such as that. But so we, we just assumed that he was of a heathen parentage. But I love it here in verse 25. Yet I suppose it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, who was of a, of a heathen heritage, my brother. So what does that tell us? It tells us that Epaphroditus got saved because someone took time to take the word of God to him. And he, and he, he received Christ as his savior. You know, here we, here we greet each other. Hello, brother. How you doing? Hello, brother. Hello, brother. <laughs> it was so funny because, you know, Jan and I are gringos. We, stand, we stood out in Bolivia. And a lot of times we could be somewhere and somebody would holler out, Hermano, welcome. And I'd say, oh, hermano. Or hermano is brother in, in Spanish, and I'd holler back, oh, hermano. And my brother and my wife would say, who is that? I'd say, it's hermano. Because, <laughs> you know, us being gringos, everybody knew who we were. But, you know, there'd be people from other churches who'd see us, and they'd just agree. But, you know, it's a wonderful thing that we can call each other brother. Because, because why? Because we're in the family of God. Because of the salvation that we have. But not only was he a uh, brother, in verse 25 it says, Yet I suppose it necessary to send you, Epaphroditus, my brother, and companion in labor. He was saying, this is a man that's worked with me in the field. 
He's a person who knows how to, to win others to the Lord. He's a person who knows to how to uh, be sacrificial to gain others to the Lord. So he's a fellow worker in the field. And then in verse 25, he also says, and fellow soldier. A fellow soldier in the fight. You know, I, I'm glad I'm in the army of the Lord. Amen. I'm glad that we have a captain who will never let us down. We have a commander-in-chief who will always be there. You know, we're, as I said, we're in the army of the Lord, and we're in a warfare. This life is a battleground from the time you get saved until the time the Lord takes us out. We're in a battle against the, against the strongest and the cruelest enemy known. You know, if you, look at, if you look at the news, you'd say, China's our enemy. China's our enemy. If you look at the news, it'll say, Russia's our enemy. Yeah, Russia's our enemy. If you look at the news and analyze it, you'll see it, they're saying D.C. is our enemy. <laughs> but our greatest enemy is Satan, because we're in a spiritual warfare. And Satan, Satan's out to defeat us, but thank God he never can. He never can. The Christian life, as I said, is a warfare from beginning to end. And we're assured of the victory. You know, that's a wonderful thing. If, if, if a soldier could go out into a battle knowing, hey, I'm going to win this. We're going to win this battle no matter what. And you know, that's the way it is for us Christians. We know that we're on the winning side. We know that what the, we know what the, the, the victory is in, in sight. And we're on a battlefield and not a playground. And how many times we need to remind ourselves. And then verse 25, speaking of Epaphroditus, he also said Epaphroditus was a messenger. He said, but your messenger, and he that ministered to my wants. As I mentioned before, the church of Philippi had sent Epaphroditus to go and take an offering to the Apostle Paul, to go and take messages to the Apostle Paul. And, uh, <clears throat> and so he took, that, he took those things to him, and he made that 800-mile tri trip from Philippi to Rome bringing those gifts and messages. You know, it's always good to hear from others. Uh, I, it, was, it was a wonderful thing. In, in the first years of Bolivia, you know, you didn't hear from others very often. But sometimes you go down to the mailbox and there'd just be something in there said, we're thinking of you, or we're praying for you. And back in those days, it took so long to get a letter from, from, the, from the states to Bolivia. By the time we got the letter, the person who wrote it was dead. I mean, it was, it was, it was almost that bad. And then, and then there, was, there was always the ham radio, and you'd say, hey, mom, over. And they'd say, hey, son, over. And then they'd say, how are you doing? Over. But you know, it, it was so good to, to be able to, to hear from, from others. And, and you can imagine the joy it was to Paul to hear through the church at Philippi, a church where he had ministered, a church where he had, had given uh, so, many, so much time to, to reach others for the Lord. So he was a messenger. He brought those great, that great message uh, from, from the church to Paul. But then in verse 25, it says also that he was a minister. The word minister here means a public servant. He, give, he gave aid or service. Look in 1 Corinthians 12. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, <clears throat> in verse 28. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, or secondly, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Well, we know some of these, some of these, our gifts are no longer, but some of these gifts we cannot possibly do. We can't, we can't all obtain, attain all these, but there's one that we can all do, and that is the ministry of helps. The ministry of helps, to give, to give aid or service to one, to assist or support. You know, we can all possess the, that gift, and it's a practical help to Paul, who was in chains. Because, you know, you can imagine Paul being in chains there and, and, and being in prison in Rome. You know, it wasn't that he could say, hey, I've got to go down to the store and get something. Or I've got to do this. Or I've got to do this. Or I need this. So Epaphroditus was there to serve. He said he was a minister unto him. And we also see that Epaphroditus was self-denying. 
You know, the, the motto of Epaphroditus may have been in one word, and that was the word others. He had an unselfish concern for others. And we see that, that as we know that Epaphroditus went to, to Rome from, from Philippi, and he got sick. I don't know if he got sick on the way or sick after he got there. We, we don't know. They said that there was, I was reading it there, in those days there was what they called the Roman fever. That many people who traveled that distance to Rome would, would get sick and many, many of them would, would die. But he didn't want others to be burdened with his troubles. He didn't want others to be burdened about his sickness. You see, some, for some way, he came 800 miles, got to Rome, he got sick, and before he could go back to Philippi, word got back to the church in Philippi that Epaphroditus was sick. And that, didn't make, that bothered him, and it made it, it, made it hard on him, because he didn't want them having to, to worry about him, because he was a, a self-sacrificing person. But then in verse 26, we see, it says, <clears throat> in verse 26 of, of Philippians 2, For he longed after you all, and was full of heaviness, because ye had heard that he had been sick. You know, the word longed there, some people say that Epaphroditus, besides being sick, was homesick. You ever been homesick? <laughs> you know, I, I remember someone said to me years ago, well, if you're a true missionary, you'll never get homesick. I wish I could have sent him there. I'll never forget in those, those early years, we lived, we lived to where we could, you didn't have air conditioning, it was hot and muggy all the time, so your windows were always open, unless the wind was blowing and raining, but it was, it was all the time, you know, you'd, you'd hear every noise from all over the town, because Santa Cruz was a small town then, but every night, Jan and I would hear something crank up, and it was that jet leaving out to go to the States. You know, so many times we'd hear that, look at each other and say, man, it'd be nice to be on that plane. I'm just being honest. <laughs> you get homesick. And you can imagine, here he was 800 miles away from home. That was a longer trip than what it is to go from here to Japan these days. I mean, and so he longed for his people. He longed to be with them. He loved them, and he wanted to be there to help them because he knew that they were suffering. They were full of heaviness, as it says, because of him being sick. And so there was a concern that he had for the people at Philippi. But then we see in verse 27, For indeed he was sick, nigh unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Paul was saying if he would have died... I would have had such great sorrow. It, it would have been such a burden to me because he came to help me, and then he died, and it would have been such a hard thing for him. But he was sick, as it said, nigh unto death. And many people think that that sickness came also because of his concern, because of his self-denial of serving others. And he knew even though he was sick, Paul needed him, and he stayed, and he ministered, and he helped, and he worked to help him. And so Paul loved Epaphroditus because he had the mind of Christ, and he knew that he could trust him. J. Vernon McGee breaks down Philippians chapter 2 and these headings. The mind of Christ, humble. The mind of God, exaltation of Christ. The mind of Paul, things of Christ. The mind of Timothy, like-minded with Paul. The mind of Epaphroditus, the work of Christ. And why were, why were Timothy and Epaphroditus so praised here? Because of one thing, they had the spirit of sacrifice. Instead of living in Philippians chapter 2, verse 21, which says, For all seek their own, not the things which of Jesus Christ. He lived in Philippians 21, 21, For me to live as Christ and to die is gain. Two men that Paul highly praised in the ministry. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Our Father, again, we, we do thank you for your blessings upon us. We thank you for your love. We thank you, Lord, for life. And Lord, may we use this life to serve you. 
to be true servants, to be fellow laborers, to be, to be soldiers in the field fighting the good fight, fight of faith. And Father, we thank you for the examples of Timothy and, and Epaphroditus. And Father, may we apply their lives to our life, Father, because they, were, they were, lived a sacrificial life, the life of a servant, a life of one whose desire was to please you. And I just pray, God, that you'd help us daily to honor you and live for you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.